So I think we'll get started. We've got a little bit of a tight schedule that we need to uh, adhere to. And uh, my name's Mike Morris. And anyway, I'm with Storm Surge, and we've been educating our communities about climate change and the effects of sea level rise and some of the changes that are coming down the pike. And so, you know, why do we have this event on rolling the dice with big storms? Well, we're also looking at ad adapting to these changes and certainly being prepared for a storm, um, having emergency management services in place and effectively recovering from a storm is a big part of adaptation. It's called being resilient and uh, mitigating damages. So, uh, you know, envisioning a bad case scenario is it's, it's really a, a good exercise to go through because we start to ponder our vulnerabilities and hopefully through the end of this process, and even, you know, this is just a short event tonight, if we ponder to those vulnerabilities, then maybe we might take some action and start tweaking things in our communities to, to uh, make us a bit more resilient. Um, but the uh, people that we have here tonight on our panel, they basically, uh, you know, envision these bad case scenarios all the time. It's part of their job and they figure out uh, where our vulnerabilities are and try to make us uh, survive these events. So I'd like to introduce our panel of, uh, of emergency uh, management directors. We have uh, from Newburyport, Police Marshal Howard. So, yeah. From the uh, town of Newbury, Police Chief Mike Riley. And from the town of Salisbury, uh, retired Fire Chief Robert Cook in the white shirt. And unfortunately, uh, Chief uh, Jonathan Brickett from Amesbury couldn't attend in the last minute tonight, so we'll miss him. Um, but also moderating our panel discussion following our storm scenario presentation is uh, someone who's had his fingers in forecasting a lot of our weather here in Massachusetts, and that's uh, Bob Thompson from the, uh, he's the meteorologist in charge at the National Weather Service in Taunton, Massachusetts. So, uh, just to save an, an idea of what we're going to try to accomplish tonight, um, my goal is to have you understand what a bad case scenario is going to be for us specifically up in this part of Massachusetts, what factors need to come together meteorologically to you know, bring this about, and what the ground level impacts might be for some of our communities, and then how emergency management works behind the scenes to help us, uh, you know, keep us safe and help us get through this event. So before we move on to the scenario, I just wanted to um, reintroduce uh, Robert Cook. He's just going to give us a quick overview of uh, how emergency management functions. And then uh, we'll start with our presentation. Thanks, Mike. Um, as he said, I'm Bob Cook, the emergency management director in Salisbury. I've been in that position since back in the 90s, um, and prior to that, I was in the fire service for many, many years before that. So I've seen a lot over my years of service, including the blizzard of 78, the no-name storm, Hurricane Bob, and several other storms that have come along. I even remember the storms in the 50s that did a tremendous amount of damage because we hadn't had any hurricanes in years and years. And, and um, Back in those days, emergency management was really called civil defense. And it was not anything like it is today. It was not well organized. Uh, there were not interconnections between the local governments, the state, and the federal government. Uh, if we had a bad enough storm, the federal government would eventually come in through FEMA and perhaps offer some aid. There was aid given in, in the 78 blizzard. Some people got it and some people didn't, depending on how well you were prepared to present your case to get money. So uh, Salisbury really didn't get anything out of that storm. They had a tremendous amount of damage, but they didn't get any aid because there was nobody there to, to uh, present their case and, and, and go on and on and on and argue for the money. Uh, Probably emergency management really became, came into its own in uh, the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and at that time, uh, there had been several major storms in Florida and other parts of the country. And nobody was well prepared for that stuff. And um, we began to realize, and we had a lot of help both from the state and the federal government, 
we began to realize that we needed to do a little bit more planning and have plans in place in case something happened so that we could react to the event and protect the citizens of our communities. And at the same time, the secret nuclear plant came along and being one of the six communities in the 10 mile zone, we were mandated to do certain planning for that. So the planning on that level helped us to plan for some of the other events that might come along, the storms and so on and so forth. Um, we, we operate under a, a state law. Uh, our authority as an emergency management director become, comes from the head of whoever, whoever the head of government in that community is. In Salisbury, it's a town manager. In Newport, I believe it's the uh, mayor. And in Newbury, it's the uh, board of selectmen. It, it varies from city and town depending on who has the final say. Once that person that's in charge gives the authority to the emergency management director, then the emergency manager, manager then operates the storm from that point on and consults with the, the town officials. Um, along with that, we, we work very, very closely with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts through the Mass Emergency Management Agency. Uh, that agency is divided into uh, three regions, four regions, three. Three regions, it used to be four, I think. It's divided into three regions, and, and uh, we work out of a, a, a sub-office that's in Tuxbury, Massachusetts. And if we need aid, if we need stuff that we don't have available, we can either through computer or by phone, we can contact that office and tell them what we need. They'll evaluate that request, see what they have available, and then from that, we'll get the aid that we need. But prior to all of that happening, I'll, I'll speak now specifically about Salvi. We have planning sessions ahead of that. We'll start two or three days ahead of a predicted storm, and we'll bring all of the necessary parties together, being the board of selectmen, the town manager, department heads, whoever we feel may be involved in that incident, we'll bring them together and we'll have a table talk. And we'll discuss around that table what we think should be done regarding the storm, the information that we get from the National Weather Service and the information we get from the state. We'll discuss that scenario and we'll make decisions based on that. As everybody in this room, I'm sure, knows, water levels are rising. And what we used to see once in a great while, we see on a pretty regular basis now with the flooding of the marshes and so on and so forth. So it doesn't take much of a storm to kick it up to the point where certain areas become impassable. When that happens, public safety is cut off from getting to those areas to help those people. This is the reason why sometimes we'll, we'll make a recommendation of an evacuation. If the predictions are serious enough, we'll make it a mandatory evacuation and we'll go door to door if we have to, to notify people. And we can do it by sections. In Salisbury, we have a program called Code Red, where we can call certain sections of the town and notify the people of what we expect and what our recommendations are. And I believe Newport has Code Red. I'm not sure on Newbury. Newbury has code red. Yeah, so the three communities have Code Red. And you can actually take, like in Newbury, for instance, they could just notify the Newbury section of Plum Island. It, it has that capability. What we do in Salisbury, in addition to that, we have the capability in the emergency management office to put slides up on the local access channel, channel 12 it happens to be in Salisbury, 12 and 18. We can actually take that channel over. We can go live on that channel if we have to. Uh, the problem is if once power goes down, that, ac that asset is no longer available, so. Uh, but when it, that's why we get the planning going early on so we can get the word out to people, so on and so forth. Um, we, uh, we held regular uh, trainings. Uh, most of our people, believe it or not, are volunteers. They do this for the sake of helping the community. And we're always, I'm gonna throw a side trip in there, we're always looking for volunteers to help us out. Um, 
because when these things happen, it's, it's very common for me to end up spending 30 or 40 hours straight at the emergency operations center because someone has got to be there to make the decisions in case something happens. Um, so that's, that's kind of the background of the way that, that we operate. Uh, another part of my job, I can't speak for the other communities, although I suspect it's probably the same, is I also interface with the Federal Emergency Management Agency when it comes to trying to get funds back after the result of major damage in the town. Uh, I'm the one that meets with those representatives from FEMA and I argue our case for what we feel we need to get for money because of the damage that is done. And there's a lot of work that goes into that. Uh, and it takes a considerable amount of time to do that. So, uh, but that's, a, that's another part of my job. Um, we, we have in Salisbury, we have two shelters. I know in Newport they have the Salvation Army and I'm not sure what else is available over there. Middle school, yes, that's right. And um, uh, what the Red Cross does now a lot of times is they, send up, they set up regional shelters. The problem for me with a regional shelter is if we get a fast breaking event and we need to move people, we don't have the ability to transport them to, to great distances. So we have two shelters in Salisbury that we utilize depending on the magnitude of the event. And well, we can transport some of those people. We have a, quite a few people in Salisbury that don't have their own transportation. So that presents a neat problem too. And um, so we have, we have arrangements to do that. Um, we can request through the state, we can request assistance from the National Guard, uh, assistance from other, other agencies. We have to do that through the state though. Uh, if we get a major event and there's property damage on the beach prior, or in other, one of the other communities, prior to anybody going back into those properties, we'll have a team come out, we'll request it through the state, we'll have a team come out and they'll survey the properties, and they'll determine whether they're fit for habitation or they're unfit for habitation or they've just got minor repairs. But there's state teams that come right out and do that, and they do that immediately after the storm so that we can get people back to a normal position as, as quickly as possible. And we try to do a lot of education at the same time on you know people planning, making sure they got a plan, know where their family is, how to contact their family, and things of that nature. We have websites. Uh, the state has an excellent website where you can go on and get recommendations for all of that stuff. So I think that's kind of a a brief overlay. I'm filling in for somebody else, so I wasn't prepared to do this. So <laughs> I had to kind of shoot from the hip. So. Thank you. All right. So this was an interesting uh, presentation for me to put together because uh, I'm a fan of meteorology and oceanography, and that's mostly been driven out of necessity and my passion for surfing. I needed to become a surf forecaster back in the day before there was an internet wave models and all that stuff. So I, I took the coursework. I did some uh, studying in the library out at UMass. Skipped a couple of parties, but obviously not all of them. And uh, kind of taught myself how to figure out when there was going to be surf so that the two hour drive back to Mass uh, Eastern Massachusetts was going to be worth it. Um, but you know, in the, in the last, uh, since the internet came online, all of this has gotten a lot easier. There's a lot of information out there, high resolution uh, satellite, um, satellite views on different websites. You can see all the weather models and the, the declassification of the Navy's uh, wave models has really narrowed all this forecasting down to even a couple of hours. Um, but after, you know, studying this stuff for 20 years, checking out, you know, weather buoys every day, looking at cams, looking at models, and you see different storms come along and they all have their own personality and certain storms have qualities or uh, intensities that others don't have. And then you start to think about some what if questions. For example, what if Sandy tracked just four hours more further to the northeast before making that turn to the west? How different would things have been here uh, along our shore? And what if the uh, perfect storm um, retrograded all the way on shore as opposed to retrograding some and then steering away? What impact would that have had for us? 
And then, for example, the blizzard of 78, which uh, is known for its snow, what if that happened in March and it was rain instead of snow? Well, then it would have been the rainstorm of 78. But we also had quite a bit of flooding during a snowstorm. So how did that happen? You know? um, so there are things uh, to ponder here and consider. And you know, with my um, knowledge of meteorology and my ability to forecast waves, I get a lot of questions from neighbors down at Plum Island. They come by every September and they say, so what's the uh, winter storm season going to be like this, uh, this year, Mike? And I said, well, you know, the science isn't really reliable enough for me to tell you in September what it's going to do the third week of December and whether you should be worried if you're down in Florida about your house, you know. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty in all this. And, uh, it's and I tell people, I says, you know, it's really a, a roll of the dice. There's so many variables that need to come together to make it all happen. But the thing with nature is, is that it rolls its dice a lot of times. And if you roll your dice enough, eventually you end up with snake eyes and something happens. So with that, we'll move forward with the uh, presentation. So I thought a bit about it. And uh, what would be a bad case scenario for us? Well, based on previous uh, storms, something that is slow moving and lasts three to four days and goes through six or eight tide cycles is fairly devastating for our coastline. Um, a retrograding approach, which means you know most storms travel west to east or from the southwest off to the northeast, and they're in and out of here in 24 hours. Now, a retrograding approach means the storm is backing in off the ocean towards us. And the reason it has significance is that if it makes a landfall to, to our south just a little bit, like around Rhode Island, it puts us in the strongest winds and waves. And as that storm is pushing to shore, it's also creating a traveling fetch, which uh, drives a building sea and surge towards the coast. Um, also, a large fetch well to the east of Cape Cod will make so, for some very large waves. And waves coming in from the direction east or east-southeast, the swell energy will pass through this big gap in the uh, continental shelf nor, known as the uh, Northeast Channel. That's about 600 feet deep. And that swell energy doesn't really encounter a significant bottom until it hits Jeffrey's Ledge and then gets tripped up. So I've noticed as a surfer, whenever we get swell from the east and southeast, it's a particularly strong and energetic swell. And then, if we had a lot of rain over frozen ground with a lot of runoff, that would be fairly uh, uh, catastrophic for us. So I just want to talk a little bit about fetch, uh, fetch to the east. This is a, a wind field diagram of what was going on with uh, Superstorm Sandy. So we have Sandy up against the New Jersey coast just about to make landfall. But there was a dynamic that was going on with a storm out uh, near the Azores, which is off to your right. And then you see that big red arrow sweeping across. So it was a big high pressure system blocking uh, Sandy to the north. And these wind fields joined together. And so we started getting long period waves from this Azores storm, maintained its intensity coming across that high pressure system. And then when those waves entered the wind field of Sandy, it became re-energized and actually got made bigger. And we had some really huge seas. Um, during that event. Now, this same setup also happened during the March 13th storm, uh, excuse me, March 2013 storm uh, last year, where we had a, a storm off to the east like this, high pressure to the north, and this really long fetch that uh, made for another record wave event. Um, so here's that uh, gap in the, uh, in the continental shelf, and uh, that swell direction is uh, fairly detrimental to us. So living along the coast, when we think of a storm threat, we generally think of two things. We think of hurricanes, and we think of northeasters. And uh, northeasters are in the meteorological world known as extratropical lows or mid-latitude low pressure systems, or you can even attach the word cyclone after any one of those. Um, OK. So <clears throat> if you look at hurricanes, uh, like at least a category one or greater storm, from this diagram, you can see that most of the landfalls pretty much happen from Cape Hatteras to the south. And there are very few landfalls to the north. So our risk, I think, from hurricanes, and you might agree, is, is not as great as it is from these northeast storms. And if you look at the storm tracks, and there's New England, you see most of the activity, by the time it gets as far north as we are, starts being directed by the westerlies out to sea or it's going to impact somewhere on the uh, southeast U.S. coast in the Gulf of Mexico. So we're at the very fringe of that risk. But uh, these types of mid-latitude lows, uh, they happen in our area. And if you plot their tracks, 
you can see that we're smack in the middle of those storm tracks. So that's where our risk comes from. What happens a lot of times with these storms is that they form to the east of us, and we don't really pay too much attention to them because they're taken off to the east, and broadcast meteorologists don't acknowledge them, but you get weather nerds like myself and uh, other people that are enthused about this sort of thing, and they key in on these storms. Now, this storm happened in March 2007. It had 100 mile an hour winds. It was just parked to the east of Nova Scotia. We didn't have much to say about it. The weather was beautiful here in Massachusetts. Um, but it, it made headlines in Puerto Rico. Now, why would anybody in Puerto Rico care about this storm up off of Nova Scotia? Well, look at what it did to the ocean surface um, heading down towards the Caribbean. So a storm 1,500 miles away created waves this big, and the only reason we didn't have that surf is because the fetch on the north side of the storm was blocked by Nova Scotia. So what if that storm was 150 miles further west? It would have been a completely different situation for us. And then, of course, we know, uh, you know, Sandy was also a very close call. So the job of all of these storms, hurricanes or exotropical lows, is basically to help the Earth normalize its temperatures. You get heat at the equator, cold at the poles, and these storms are trying to equalize the uh, temperature between the two. So how well did our tropical uh, Atlantic uh, hurricane season fare in terms of, you know, um, eliminating some of this heat? Well, if you look at uh, our hurricane season, you'd have to conclude it was a snoozer. I mean, we forecast 16 storms. We actually had 13, so we didn't do too bad in predicting that. But where we were really off was the number of tropical storms versus hurricanes. We predicted 12 hurricanes. We only got two, and really most everything was a tropical storm. But the thing to focus in on is this accumulated uh, cyclone energy index. Um, and basically what that is, it's a measure of the season's storm energy. And so if you have a season full of weak storms and they don't last for very long, you're going to get a low uh, energy score. Whereas if you have a lot of intense storms and they go on for a number of days, then it's a high score. So looking at this, the red line shows that the, the ACE index for 2013 was about a third or a quarter of what uh, would be expected to be normal. So it was a very weak season. So you'd have to conclude that we didn't liberate much heat energy from the ocean this tropical season. So what happened to all the heat energy? Well, if you look at sea surface temperature anomalies, in other words, this is how much warmer the waters are in December than what they were expected to be. We see that the world's oceans are about three to five degrees warmer than what we would expect them to be in December. And with all of that, that heat energy in the ocean, and most people say, oh, well, you know, what's three to five degrees? You know, if it's 50 degrees, 53 or 55, I still put on a jacket when I go outside. It doesn't really matter. But I say to them, well, think about a swimming pool the size of the Atlantic Ocean, and you need to heat that with electricity three to five degrees. What do you think your electric bill would be? <laughs> There's a ton of energy in that ocean um, to heat that much water, just that little bit. And when the meteorological variables align, it's going to tap into that heat, and it makes for some crazy storms. Now, you should recognize this storm. Maybe you don't recognize it here. Down in the lower right-hand corner, that's the northwest coast of Africa. And um, this was the storm that started out January 3rd here in the northeast that gave us that light, fluffy snow and some coastal flooding. Once it got over that warmer ocean and it got some upper air level support, it blossomed into this monster. And to give you a a little idea, this is what it did to the ocean surface. There's a huge swath of about 750 miles or more of 30 to 50 foot seas. And this is all somewhat interesting, you know, okay, this is a graphic of what's going on in the ocean, 50 foot waves. Well, nobody can really imagine what a 50 foot wave is. I can barely imagine it. I've been in 15 to 20 foot waves, and I understand the power that's involved, but, you know, wave power goes up exponentially with size. So, if, you know, a 50 foot swell is purely incredible. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you down to ground level. So you see that little swath where that uh, is like a little cut in, into the wave field down near the bottom. That's the Azores Islands. And they were seeing um, a 30 to 35 foot swell come in there. And just to show you what that looks like, it, it's, it's, it's just enormous. I mean, the, the amount of energy that was in that ocean that got pulled up into that storm and created these waves. 
And fortunately, the Azores are a craggly volcanic uh, series of islands, so they won't wash away. But they did sustain some damage. I mean, they weren't even really in the storm. They were just experiencing the waves. And underneath that 20-foot crane is a stone fishing pier um, where they unload fishing boats and things. And this picture was taken from, in, from Portugal on like an 80-foot cliff looking down on the 60-foot wave that broke there. And then all along the Azores on their coastal roads, they had these seawalls that are mortared together with rocks, uh, cemented together, and uh, many of them were damaged. And then also along roadways, you'd find these huge rocks that were cast up from the ocean bottom and heaved over the seawalls um, onto this roadway and parking lot. And uh, you know those rocks are probably about the size of the rocks that we're using on the uh, stone structure down on Plum Island. So even if you're up on a cliff, this becomes a little bit challenging. And I think this last picture kind of really sums up the energy there. I mean, here we have this 80, 90-foot cliff, that 20-foot lighthouse set back from there. And, I mean, just look at that. It's, uh, I, I find it pretty incredible. So anyway, so what are the uh, ingredients that we need to, to make a powerful storm? Well, storms like a contrast. They like cold air over, uh, they like the cold air in, uh, contrasting with uh, southern warmth. Um, we have that, of course, here. Um, they like cold air over uh, warm waters, like the Gulf Stream. They like a lot of moisture, and we've got an ocean, a Gulf Stream, and a subtropical jet stream close by. And they like to form underneath a wavy jet stream, which we'll talk about in a second. And they also like it when the uh, tropical uh, and polar jets merge together. So let's just talk a second about jet streams. So we've got two jet streams, generally speaking. Um, and there are rivers of fast-moving air high in the atmosphere, and they circulate around the globe. And we've got the polar jet, and that separates the frigid Arctic air from the temperate latitudes, and then we've got the subtropical jet separating the equatorial uh, heat from the mid-latitudes. And you get these little waves that travel th through them, and storms typically like to form in the uh, troughs of those waves. What's been going on with uh, a warming climate is that we start to get these really big undulations in the jet stream. And when we get these really big undulations, a couple of things happen. You get areas where the jet's moving really fast and weather systems move right along. And then you get those lighter blue areas where they start to slow down. And sometimes this thing even just stalls out or cuts off a part of its flow. And a weather system will just kind of slow down and stall. Um, but storms really like to form when that jet stream dips way to the south like that, puts cold air over the uh, really warm waters to the south. And then there's some things going on in the upper, air, uh, upper atmosphere called divergence, which allows for low pressure to form in right around where that arrow is pointing. Um, and this uh, also t uh, explains some of the crazy weather we've had here. I mean, if you look at this jet stream on the right, um, if you're down in Louisiana, you're experiencing uh, cold weather and snow. But if you're on the left side in that ridge that goes up the uh, west coast, you get dry, arid conditions and 50 degree warmth up in Alaska, which is basically what we've been seeing so far this morning, some strange things like that. So the point is with all of this, in a warming climate, the ocean's going to store more heat energy to fuel storms. It encourages this wavy polar jet stream, and that polar jet uh, digs deep into the south, and when it does that, it brings that contrast uh, to the tropical air and the warm water. Um, it can phase with that tropical jet further to the south, and it basically encourages uh, storm formation and weather systems can slow down and actually start moving backwards from their normal direction. So we're basically increasing our odds uh, for rolling the dice for a, a bad storm. So let's build our storm. Uh, in my mind, a storm arriving in early March is uh, a problem for us. It's still cold enough to be without power, to be wet. Um, frost is in the ground. You know, If we get rain on top of frozen ground, we're going to get a lot of runoff. Um, daytime highs we talked about. And, uh, you know, let's say we have meteorologists talking about this big ocean storm that they expect to form somewhere near Bermuda and they think it's going to start backing into the shore. So this is basically the jet stream scenario. We get high pressure pushing off the uh, southeast Atlantic coast over the Gulf Stream. The two jets phase. We get low pressure starting to develop where those two jets are merging. If we draw a uh, surface map like you might see on broadcast uh, news. We're going to get a high pressure cell up uh, to the north that's going to block this low pressure system from traveling off to the east. 
We've got that cold uh, Canadian high pressure moving in from the west. And then off to the east near the Azores, we've got another storm uh, interacting with that high there. And when you draw in the wind, you see that we've got a fetch set up similar to the situation we had with uh, Sandy. And the storm off near the Azores is going to throw a swell that's going to get absorbed by the uh, developing storm and it's going to create an even larger sea state. So day one, this is when we anticipate what's arriving. Everybody's telling us this is going to happen. And we get on the satellite view and we look and we've got a storm 330 miles to the southeast in Nantucket and it's moving northwest in our direction. And here on shore, we're seeing northeast winds at 25 to 35 miles an hour, and the winds are starting to veer actually to the east um, as the storm approaches. The storm starts throwing in some spiral bands of clouds and some snow showers, and then we start to get some rain. Storm's well forecast in advance, and all the publicity we have about Plum Island and what's going on here, we're going to have <laughs> the news teams are going to be all over the place. That's a whole other part of managing a crisis, is managing these guys. And here, look at this, who's that guy? <laughs> Talking to the Weather Channel. Um, and then, of course, we're going to have a lot of people that are going to show up at the beach and gonna, we want to get pictures of this as this is happening. So by the end of that day, with this scenario, we would expect seas to build to about 10 to 15 feet with a short period of 8 to 10 seconds. And the waves are going to be coming from the northeast because this is all still locally generated waves. And we've got this wave power of 2,500 kilojoules per meter. And I'll explain that briefly. This period we're talking about, 8 to 10 seconds, that describes how far apart these waves are from each other. The further they are apart, the more power they have. Um, 2,500 kilojoules, just to put that in perspective to you, if you go to the beach in the summertime and you get a knee or thigh high wave and it knocks you in the knee, that's about 50 to 100 kilojoules. You get a three to four foot wave, that hits you in the stomach or in the chest and knocks you on your butt, that's about 250 to 350 kilojoules. So 2,500 is pretty strong. It's what we had in the, uh, the January 4th, uh, uh, third storm, was wave energy of that, about that magnitude. And then with the wind and the wave action, we're going to get this sea foam that blows in and it's full of sand and it sticks to everything. And I'm sure we've seen that there if you've lived down on Plum Island. And as all of this ocean is put into motion and, and it's advancing towards the shore, we're going to see a one-foot storm surge on top of, let's say, a nine-foot tide. So all of a sudden, we have a 10-foot tide. And that starts putting that water up against our barrier dune. Now, the other thing that happens with this rising ocean and swell is the sea level <coughs> off our barriers gets higher than the level of water in our river. And if it's high, uh, and the tide's low, that water starts pouring into our uh, river basin and starts filling up the marsh with seawater. And this is actual footage from what happened in March. We had a little bit of snow, we didn't have any rain, but look at the water covering the marsh here. And you can see it's right up against the causeway. You look at these houses on the old point. I mean, an extra eight or, eight, eight or 12 inches of water would really make a difference to this barrier island. And that, that, uh, that real narrow stretch there at the end of the basin is very precarious looking, very thin part of Plum Island. And then when you get down a little closer, you can see what a 15 to 20 foot sea looks like when you compare it to the houses and those waves are probably breaking offshore on the outer bar there, a good half mile out or more. So day two, uh, we've got some winds of change occurring here. And so now our storm, is 150 miles to our southeast and it bombs out and what that basically means in meteorological terms, it reaches its peak uh, or its lowest uh, central pressure and its strongest winds. So our seas, they ramp up 15 to 25 feet. The period starts to increase 12 to 15 seconds and that's reflective of the wave energy coming in from offshore. And the direction also changes. It comes in from the east-southeast passing through that gap in the uh, continental shelf. And our wave power increases fourfold to 10,000 kilojoules per meter. Now, this is the wave energy we had back in March. Um, we had that type of sea and we had that type of wave energy. So we have an idea of what that wave energy uh, means to us. And as the day progresses, the tide inches up to a 12-foot tide. And this ocean really starts to stress our barrier dune. And that's a picture of a Salisbury Beach camp from last March. 
Um, so vulnerable, vulnerable areas along Plum Island and Salisbury Beach start to experience what's known as buried doing splash over at high tide. And we start to see some water and sand running into the streets behind the, the homes and the dunes. And this water is really getting caught up uh, behind the barrier beaches and along our causeways. The causeways are actually blocking water from flowing to other parts of the marsh to try to equalize the uh, water levels. And it starts to get, be a little bit deep and hard to cross those causeways. And then the water starts seeping its way up through the backside of the barriers and into the neighborhoods from the rear. And this is what happened during the storm of 78. And then inland, like in Amesbury, uh, all this heavy rain runoff is just flowing right into the tributaries and starts rushing down the Powar River, for example. And those tributaries, they all feed the Merrimack. The Merrimack ra raises, and here we have a picture of uh, Cashman Park with a couple of feet of water in it and the condominiums just to the east of there. And then uh, with the winds at 45 to 55 miles an hour with nearing hurricane gust, we start to see trees coming down like we did in that March storm we had uh, several years ago. And we start to get some scattered power outages. Now day three is peak intensity. This is when the storm prepares to make landfall. And this is actually a picture of the storm of 78 parked just to our southeast. And so this storm um, is about to make landfall. It's pulling in that wave energy from that storm near the Azores. You can see that storm out there. This is actually uh, uh, a, a wave uh, graphic from Sandy in that situation there. And it builds the sea further. And this is a actual model uh, graphic from Sandy making landfall on eastern Long Island near Rhode Island versus down near New Jersey. And you can see when a storm makes landfall in that position, this big 50-foot wave swath coming in through uh, the Northeast Channel into the Gulf of Maine. And it starts to get knocked down as it uh, crosses Jeffrey's Ledge. But we still have a 30-foot sea spilling into uh, Ipswich Bay. And we're also in, the, in the, uh, the highest winds on that side of the storm as well. So, in that type of scenario, we would expect 25 to 35 foot seas with a long period of about 17 seconds, and the wave power goes up th three to four, uh, two to three times that of what we saw in March. And uh, these are actual pictures of shorelines, similar to Plum Island, but they were on uh, Long Island and New Jersey, and these are waves from Sandy. And when you get wave energy, of that magnitude, um, unless you're using like armored stone that where each stone weighs tons instead of just hundreds of pounds, those waves will take those rocks uh, and it'll wash the sand out from under them, the wall will collapse and whatever loose rocks are there, since they're not mortared together, they'll get heaved into the very houses that they're trying to protect. So while that wall will protect those houses to some degree from minor storms, if you get a, something of this magnitude, um, they're going to be a liability. And we start to get significant washover at this point, uh, Plum Island Center near Annapolis Way and Mad Martha's, and you're going to see sand and debris starting to wash over into the roads, and you're going to have a fairly steady stream of water coming over the barrier dune and washing back down into the marsh. And the same thing uh, we would expect to see happen at Salisbury Beach Center, where you get a fair amount of overwash already and also at a fairly low spot where there was a big overwash long before they put houses there around 14th and 17th streets on Salisbury Beach. And at this point in the storm, we would pretty much expect that we and the rest of the state uh, would probably not have much in the way of electrical power. And with all this water coming down the rivers um, and the causeways trapping water, I think access to the barriers uh, would probably be um, uh, difficult, if not impossible. And then we'd see parts of Plum Island Point, um, low-lying properties along the, uh, the Great Marsh would uh, start to see some flooding as this water starts to accumulate. And places like Rings Island may become isolated at high tide um, with uh, water coming in through the marsh. Uh, Newburyport, you know, certainly has some vulnerabilities. Um, we've seen some fairly high waters here. This was the, uh, from the Mother's Day storm. And we can see it's already up to the level of the boardwalk there. 
And we'd have to wonder, you know, what would happen to our national grid facility along the waterfront and the water treatment plant with uh, this type of an inundation. Um, inland a little bit, the Little River backs up because it can't empty into the marsh. We get some water that gets trapped behind the railroad be beds that o become overtopped, and then that water spills and backs up into the industrial park. And uh, then along Amesbury, with the Merrimack River raging with runoff uh, from inland, we start to see some flooding along Main Street and Point Shore. And then you got to wonder about all that water that rushes through the center of Amesbury. I don't really don't understand what happens underneath that town center there with all that water. I mean, it's got, you must have built that town on top of a gorge, otherwise I can't see how that doesn't wash away. Um, and then uh, in Amesbury, you have low-lying areas near a back river that would flood and trap water uh, in the hilly terrain would wash out some roads. So day four is the aftermath. This is where we actually get to see what happened. Our storm center is out, out over northeast New York State, spinning itself out, it's losing its energy. Starting to get some sun back, but it's still uh, fairly cool outside. Um, we still have a big swell rolling in. This is going to abate over four days' time as that swell train runs out from the open ocean. And we start to see our floodwaters recede um, in the marsh. And then we go out and assess our damages. And if you take a plane flight over the wildlife refuge, you'd likely see something like this. And this is what's called an overwash. And from a coastal geologist's point of view, this is kind of a spectacular thing. You kind of understand, hey, I understand what the ocean's doing here. It wants to take the sand at the front of this beach, and it wants to push it back towards the mainland. And you can see these streaks of overwash where it's actually put sand on top of uh, the marsh there. And, th and it does it piecemeal. It does it in spots. It's not going to move a barrier beach in one storm. It'll be one storm, and then 10 years later, it might be another one. And piecemeal, this island starts to move itself backwards. And that lower fan there, that sand is actually about 10 feet deep um, in that overwash. So it moves quite a bit of sand. But when you look at nature pulling the rug out from underneath a populated uh, beach, um, it looks a lot more like a war zone than a National Geographic special. And these are images from Sandy, and uh, it, that storm just pushed the sand down the streets, uh, along with the foundations of the houses and cars and, uh, and everything else. And here you can see how deep the sand is there. That mailbox on the left is about probably three or four feet high, and so these people are standing on about three feet of sand in their neighborhood. neighborhood. And then when you know we go inland, it's really it's, it's a wet task. You know, flooded basements, washed out roads, flooded roads, and uh, and some of our infrastructure downtown uh, compromised by the, uh, the floods. So, how realistic is this type of storm? So, if you look at the statistics of our hypothetical storm on the right, if we look at central pressure. We chose 950 millibars. It kind of puts it smack in the middle of these three uh, New England storms, the perfect storm Sandy and the Northeast Blizzard. But if you look at what's been going on over in Europe this uh, winter season, um, it's actually on the weaker side of those storms, both in terms of you know, winds and central pressure. And certainly the wave heights are in line with our three uh, big storms that we've had in New England here before, but smaller than what's been going on in Europe. And our uh, surge and, and peak tides are also similar to previous storms. Now, where this storm differs is that it's a slow-moving storm, three to four days in duration, and it also dumps a lot of rain. And that's how, the, and it also made landfall, whereas, for example, the perfect storm in, in the blizzard of 78 never made landfall. So it's a fairly uh, realistic possibility, and it is a roll of the dice as to when something like this is going to happen. But it's something you need to think about. And when you look at this and think about your vulnerabilities, it just helps you plan for it and, and adapt. So now I want to turn this over to Bob Thompson to moderate a discussion with our emergency management directors and, and see what their comments might be. My earliest memories was when I was about five years old. And my dad took me down to the next town, Citroen. I grew up in Cohasa, the South Shore. Went down to Citroen, this was in 1956. And we took a look at the Otrusco freighter that had gotten washed ashore on a, a major nor'easter. 
back in March of 1956. So that's one of my earliest uh, memories and perhaps that got me interested in this. And then when I came into my current position, I wasn't in it for very long when we had Hurricane Bob in 1991 and then the October 1991 storm or the perfect storm, the well named storm, October 1991. And then just a year later, we had another somewhat of a megastorm of December 1992 that some of you may remember. Not quite up to the level of the 1991 storm, but it had a major impact on the coast too. So I think that kind of solidified we really do have an issue along our coastline. And as been alluded to, the stakes continue to increase as the sea level uh, continues to rise. Uh, we work from the National Weather Service very closely with the emergency management community. And we're going to kind of step through this as they take some information that we would provide them on this type, on this scenario. And, uh, and from that, they type what we're looking at in terms of a broader impact along the coastline that we envision with always some uncertainty built in. That's the nature of the, the business, but as we get closer to the event, we hope to become a little more focused, a little clearer, just like when you're driving, it might be a little fuzzy, uh, a mile, a mile and a half ahead, but as you get closer, you start to better read the signs more clearly. And then these folks will then take that information and go through a, a, a series of steps that will really help localize the, the response, and that's what we're going to be uh, focused on this evening. So, uh, this event, uh, the scenario we're dealing with is indeed a uh, pretty close to worst case, but definitely plausible, as, uh, as Mike noted. And I might add, before we turn it over to these folks, that just in the last about three or four years, we've had three events that could have been much worse than they were if only the timing of the track was a little different. Mike already alluded to Sandy. 200 miles further north would have had a much greater impact on this coastline. I saw what happened along the Rhode Island south coast. It's pretty, pretty incredible, but just a couple hundred miles further north. Just last February, the February uh, 2013 blizzard, had that occurred a few hours earlier or on a seceding tide, which was higher, the same, uh, and the storm surge had coincided with the high tide, which it did not during that storm. It also would have been a substantially greater impact along our coastline. And then eventually, probably not too many, of you, too many of you remember, going back to February 26, 2010, very high winds, lots of wind damage in this area. That storm overnight brought a six and a half foot storm surge into Boston Harbor. Similarly high storm surge along this part of the coastline. It was after the high tide, a few hours afterwards, but just a few hours. Only about two to three hours sooner had that surge occurred. It would have been an enormous impact on our coastline, and we really dodged a, a bullet on that. So we've had, even without sea level rise, we've had a few events just in the last uh, a few years that could have really done uh, uh, quite a number on us. And of course, with sea level rise, the stakes rise. So the way we want to uh, uh, do this is um, we're going to start about four days out. So you've seen the scenario now. We're about four days out, and these gentlemen um, will start getting word uh, passed on through, if not directly, indirectly through the state, as to what we're thinking in the, in the National Weather Service. And uh, at this point, when we're about four days out, we're going to be talking about uh, what looks to be a, uh, a high impact potentially high impact coastal storm about four days out. We're not be sure exactly how it's going to come out, but even we're concerned enough that we go ahead and we start conference calls with the uh, Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency and other folks. And these folks, if not on the call, will be getting information from the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency or MEMA, MEMA on some of the uh, information, probably forwarding our PowerPoint presentations. 
and the information indicate a possibility of moderate to major coastal flooding for at least two or three high uh, tide cycles starting in about four days. So really what we'd like to do, uh, and maybe we'll go uh, from left to right for those of you facing the, the front here. So maybe we'll start with uh, Police Chief Mike Riley in, in Newburgh. What kind of actions about four days out? You're not exactly sure just what we're going to have for potentially high impact of moderate to meet the coast of flooding, enough to probably get your attention, but it's still several days out. Uh, at that point, because of the uncertainty and a lot of the weather forecasts, we notify our emergency management team, we make sure that all of our equipment is in working order, all of our radios, our generators, and we just want to make sure we're ready to respond. Um, I had a conversation with the town administrator and the board of selectmen <coughs> saying this storm is coming. We don't know the forecast, the exact forecast yet. It has the potential to have uh, moderate to major storm flooding and we have to be prepared. At that point, that's about it. I'll, I'll have a conversation with City Marshal Howard because we share an island and we all, any storm, we're in constant <coughs> communication and we get on the same page. Um, but for us, right then, that's about it. I, I'm in constant contact with uh, Mass Emergency Management. Um, four days out, we're not on the National Weather Conference calls yet. Um, when the storm track becomes more defined and there's a higher um, degree of certainty with whether or not we're actually going to get that flooding, which usually occurs a couple of days out, not four days. That's when we start actually joining into those conference calls for uh, localized specific questions. Tom? Uh, additionally, I think that we start looking at what our resources are, what resources we may need. We start talking about regionalization because we know that um, some places that we use for evacuation um, needs to change. So we start looking at the possibilities. If uh, A scenario plays out, this is where we're going to move people to. If it's B, uh, we're going to move someplace different, whether it be in Newburyport, Salisbury, Ainsbury, or into a regional farther out. And I think we also have a discussion with Region 1 with um, Richie Man uh, Mimer as to what resources we may think we need and what's the, going to be the availability given the rest of the state may be looking for those same resources. So we kind of just get an idea of what's available to us, when we could possibly get it, and when we should start thinking about staging that better uh, equipment. Basically, there's not a lot that I can add to that other than that, uh, <coughs> like they stated, we'd be, we'd be in contact with local <coughs> Uh, officials, I'd talk, be talking specifically with the fire chief, police chief, and the DPW director initially. I'll let them know what was coming. We're in constant contact with, with mass emergency management, uh, getting the weather updates and so on and so forth. We'll be checking our equipment, uh, looking at what we think we may need in addition to that, and kind of giving me more a heads up as to what we expect we might need. Uh, and we'll be looking towards a more detailed planning meeting within a day or so. We'll be checking all our equipment and stuff, make sure everything is functional. Uh, one of the things that we'll look at, because we have a fairly large number of people in Salvador that are, don't have any type of transportation, we'd be looking at what we can get for transportation assets. Because if the storm develops of the predictions that they say it's going to develop, we need to be prepared ahead of time to move people. So. That's what we would be doing as the initial planning at that point. All right, great. Let's fast forward. Now we're about 42 to 72 hours away. The National Weather Service has issued a coastal flood watch and indicated the potential for major coastal flooding and severe beach erosion. Uh, with increasing confidence of a major storm, Details will still become clear as the time gets closer, but there's some preliminary estimates now that we're going to be seeing a storm surge on the order of four or greater feet and waves just a little bit offshore maxing out at 30 or perhaps a little bit greater uh, uh, feet. So 30 plus foot waves just offshore with the possibility of multiple high tide cycles impacted. And that's significant in itself because as you impact on successive tide cycles, you kind of weaken. The March 2013 storm did 
comparable and in some places even worse damage in the February 2013 blizzard, even though the seas and the surge were not quite as high, but the shoreline was more vulnerable. <coughs> so with this in mind, and it so happens we're in a spring tide cycle around where the sun and the moon are in conjunction. And if you look at the tide tables, that is true for early March 2014. Um, so now the, the question is, what are some actions that may be taken at this time, such as staffing, maybe some allocation of assets, uh, which would be at this point 48 to 72 hours out, what about communication with other community officials, departments, and in town? And any information that might be sent from the emergency management or uh, by town officials to the, the community's population at large. So once again, why don't we start uh, from, uh, from left to right. So I will go back to uh, Chief Riley here. All right. Uh, this is the time when we typically we kick into action. Uh, <coughs> we will notify all the emergency management responders, whether it's police or fire, that they're expected to be at the storm for the duration. Uh, with new emergency management, we make arrangements for people that live quite a distance away, just staying here. We, we make bunk arrangements and that type of thing. We don't allow people to go home to work in shifts. Uh, same with fire departments. Uh, we coordinate with Newbury Fire. Um, the, we have a great emergency management team which consists of the building inspector, um, the town administrator, fire chief, myself, and, <coughs> and conservation. Uh, they're all involved. They're all in the emergency commands hosts. They're all involved in the decision making. Um, at that point, we will be in close contact with mass emergency management about locating assets up in our area. Typically, we uh, stage, in conjunction with new report, um, assets for evacuation the vulnerable areas. Uh, we'll stage assets if they're available at the new report armory, and they've been very good. Um, we wait and see if the governor declares a state of emergency. Um, if that happens, then we can actually request those assets from the National Guard. The National Guard can't deploy assets through mass emergency management unless there's a state of emergency declared. Um, so that's a very important milestone if the governor declares a state of emergency uh, that, that allows us access to even more assets to help us out. Um, we typically, we've gone through so many storms in all of these communities, we know our vulnerable areas and around our waterways. It's not just Plum Island, I mean Plum Island is the obvious and you know 72 hours out from a storm is Satellite City out on Plum Island and every looky loo in the world is out there trying to see the waves and, and get on the news. But it's not just Plum Island that's vulnerable in a town like Newbury or a city like Newbury Port or Salisbury. Uh, we have to strongly consider the height of the storm surge and subsequent high tide cycles. We're going to lose Route 1 at the Marsh area, major thoroughfare, Hanover Street in, in Newbury typically floods, Middle Road, Scotland Road, um, the center of Byfield where the rivers are. I mean, those are, very, those are vulnerable areas, and depending upon the forecast, and the more detailed the forecast is, and the more confidence that national weather has in the forecast, we may be staging assets on di in different areas of town being ready to shut down those roads and move residents who would be otherwise cut off, advise them to leave. Um, at that point, we might also send out a code red to the town. Um, we would definitely send out a code red message to Plum Island. Um, in a storm like that, we are going to lose 100% certainty. We will lose Plum Island Turnpike. Um, we will probably lose um, Sunset and Old Point Road from the back flood of the marsh through subsequent high tides. In a normal storm, it's just high tide dependent. We lose the road, the tide recedes, we inspect the road, make sure it's safe, and then we open the road back up. In a storm like this, it could be different. Um, I know in Sandy, we, were, we had a um, Voluntary evacuation. We called for it. It was, looked like it was going to trek a little further north. It would have been a mandatory, but we, we settled um, between Newburyport and Newbury. All of our town leaders met and a voluntary was put into place. But in a storm like this, depending upon the certainty, a voluntary evacuation could turn into a mandatory evacuation within, you know, 24 to 48 hours of it. So, huh? I think they might hit it that you know 48 hours out we start having a daily 
um, conference culture um, National Weather Service. We kind of take out a tweak from what they're telling us. Uh, the resources are brought into the city area. We, uh, we come up with a plan for deployment. We come up with plans A and B, whether there's going to be an evacuation, if there isn't going to be an evacuation, if it's voluntary, if it's not. Basically, the evacuation is simply telling people that your chance of getting out of there is nil when the storm comes. And we know we've had many times where people believe, you know, we've called Wolf again and it didn't happen. Uh, we can only go by prediction. And we're looking at what can we give you and what can we realistically believe we can get to you. Uh, Palm Island is a, a real challenge. The idea is not that the island is going to disappear. It's simply that we can't get to you and you can't leave. Uh, we've got vehicles now that can go through eight feet of water. Again, but you know, there's no guarantees given over a long period of time what the condition of the roadway is. So if we lose the road and actually wash it away, then simply having vehicles that can drive to water is not going to be really effective for you. Um, Again, we look at, like I said, the, the evacuations, and we look at a much greater area than many people look at. We tend to feel like we're looking at the, the river and, you know, what's the problem going to be. But as Mike said, we've got many areas in the western part of the city that can all of a sudden people have no um, belief that the water's coming in from behind them. Um, so we have the maps. We know the water's going to hit. It's, we've been through the drill a lot. Um, and I think as you do the drill, you become better at uh, preparing and knowing what your assets and needs are going to be going forward. And lastly, um, once this kicks up, we also kick up with um, National um, Grid. They also have a, a, conference, a, a center that they bring online, and they start also bringing resources into the city or into the areas that they believe are going to be um, of need. Um, and many of these stars, if any of you have been up by the court garage, you may find 30, 40 um, tree trucks up there, because if we can't remove the trees, we can't give you back the power. So there's a, a process in place to give power back. Power comes back in a way that uh, is most needed. Um, police, fire, hospitals, all those things. So no matter where you live, we all know what your problems are. We can actually tell what the problems are today, but it comes back in cycles. And like I said, you've got to get the stuff cleaned off of it before they can actually give you back power. At this point, uh, we would hold our first strategy meeting where we bring all of the department heads to the Board of Selectmen Town Manager town manager's assistant into a meeting. We go around the room, we discuss, based on the information that we've had from the National Weather Service through MEMA, we would discuss what everybody would get <coughs> ideas from everybody or what they think would be the best approach to take. Once we do that, we will then start to develop some decisions on what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to be faced with a storm like this. We're going to lose access to Salisbury Beach. We're going to lose access to Route 1 to the south of Salisbury Square. No question about it. And also access on Ferry Road. So there's not going to be any way to detour traffic coming from Newport. We're going to have to, traffic is going to have to be blocked off in the city of Newport. And, and route however they determine. We're obviously at that point, when that happens, we're going to have to bring National Guard in to help to do that. Uh, and that has to be requested through the state. Um, one of the things that really concerns me, if we get a large storm, we have several commercial properties that are right on the ocean front. And those commercial properties have large gas services, natural gas services. And they're not well protected. And we know from past experience, we had large sections of North End Boulevard and we had gas bubbling up for hundreds of feet in the middle of the road. And I asked, at the time, I asked, uh, it was Essex County Gas at that time, I asked them to shut the gas main down. Well, we're not going to shut it down because we're going to have to relight all those pilots. So I said, well, I'm ordering you to shut it down. I didn't give them a choice because we had to do something at that point because then the gas was going to start getting into people's basements and so on and so forth. So those are. That's another area that we're going to look at. We're going to have to bring in representatives from National Grid to discuss that. That's a major concern of mine because once you get a, a major gas rupture on one of those buildings like the Blue Ocean or something, and first of all, you've got limited access, and second of all, if the water's coming in, there's not much you can do. If that ignites, you've got major problems. So that's another concern. We're going to be looking at do we need to think about evacuating people at this point? Do we want to do a recommend an evacuation? Do we want to encourage people that have family in another in a 
inland area to go with relatives, if that's at all possible. We'll be looking at our ability to open our two shelters. We're probably in a storm like this, we're going to have to open our largest shelter, which is the local elementary school. Uh, we're going to look at all of that. Uh, we're going to start staffing our EOC with people to answer phones because people are going to have questions. There's going to be a lot of questions that are going to be asked. Um, and we'll have temporary staff on in all those positions. And there's going to be a lot of planning, but things are going to start to really kick into high gear at this point because we're now getting information from the National Weather Service that it's getting pretty concrete that we're going to get a pretty good storm. And we know we're not going to have any access to the beach. We're not going to have access through 286 because that's going to flood over also. And like I say, the major route into Salisbury, Route 1. Another area we'll have a problem is north of the square with, where there's a small brook there, a small fox brook. That's going to flood over Lafayette World there. And I've seen three to four feet of water there in the past. So you know, there's going to be a lot of areas of Salisbury that aren't going to be accessible. So uh, we're going to have to look at all of that stuff, and you know we're beginning now to really kick into high gear, and to, you know we're going to be faced with making some serious decisions really quickly. <coughs> okay, thank you. Well, now let's put ourselves in the position where it is the morning of the day before day two of the scenario. And keep in mind the roof serious impact. We're in day two, day three, more severe on day three, but still very significant on day two. So let's put ourselves in the morning before the, uh, the really serious stuff starts to, uh, starts to impact us. At this point, the National Weather Service has a coastal flood warning in the pack. In, in fact, a watch means the potential for uh, uh, moderate or major coastal flooding. Warning means that it is either evident or it's expected to a high degree of confidence. So warning's in effect. Anticipating for that next day a storm surge of three and a half to four feet, waves of 20 to 25 feet just offshore. And looking ahead to the following day, we're anticipating conditions to worsen because this is a slow moving retrograde storm, worsen to a surge of around five feet which will bring the total tide up of 14 and a half to 15 feet above mean lower or low water, for those of you who can relate to that data, and waves now maxing out 30 to 35 feet just offshore. So that's the day after tomorrow. So the next day is still very significant with a four foot, uh, uh, near four feet of storm surge and uh, waves 20 to 25 feet becoming still worse the following day of uh, a surge up to five feet, close to 15 feet in terms of uh, total water level, and waves of 30, 35 feet offshore. So again, the questions, so the, the action's different from what you may have already taken. And let me throw two more, <coughs> maybe two more questions to focus on at this stage. One, is there anything in terms of state coordination or assistance that you might be looking at at this point? Keep in mind, we're still day before the, the real impact. And then maybe especially this, what concern is most likely to keep you up at night at this point? <laughs> well, probably going to be up at night <laughs> here uh, for the operation center, but uh, I think you get the, the gist of what I'm asking there. So um, let's, uh, let's kind of run through that if we could. And again, we'll, uh, we'll go out of routine here, so I would you right. All right, a day out, and it doesn't look good. It doesn't look any better. Um, as a matter of fact, it looks worse. At that point, we would coordinate with a new report and the city officials in a new report for a coordinated effort, a, a unified effort, for what we're going to do with Plum Island. Um, in a scenario like this, where multiple high tide cycles will be impacted, and the high tide from the river won't be able to back out because that ledge is keeping it in, um, we're going to lose Old Point Road. We're, there's going to be three or four feet of water, and, and we saw this on the uh, Mother's Day storm, three feet of water right at Plum Island, um, the Plum Island Grill, just ripping across the road. You can't get vehicles through that. Um, you can't get anybody on the island, you can't get anybody off the island. 
I would recommend an evacuation of Plum Island for the duration of that storm. Um, I, Tom and I have talked a hundred times during a hundred different storms, and the worst thing you can do as an emergency manager is be the guy that cried wolf. You know, the sky is falling and whatever, because the first time you order an evacuation and then the storm isn't that bad, nobody will listen to you again. So we, we take it very seriously. Um, Hurricane Earl. We've been talking about that three or four years ago. Hurricane Earl was ripping up the coast and, you know, national weather and everybody was saying major impact, major impact, major impact, three, four days out. And we continue to have, have um, conversations and, you know, the media showed up at Town Hall, you're going to evacuate Plum Island. We don't answer to the media, we answer to the citizens of our towns. So we waited and waited and national weather they were very good. They're like, listen, the degree of certainty in this forecast isn't there, you know? So we didn't call for the evacuation. And luckily, the storm took a hard right and went out to sea, and it was a beautiful day when we were supposed to have a hurricane. You know, if we had called for an evacuation then with all the media pressure, no one would ever listen to us again. So it, it's extremely important that we, we're coordinated, we're as certain as we can be um, before we do that. But in a situation like this, I would definitely call for an evacuation because I'm not going to put my people out there in harm's way. Where I would stage my own people would be in Pitta Hall, which will be under three feet of water. So I'm not putting my people in harm's way. And for, for me, I would order the evacuation. And if people don't want to leave, I just recommend to get a Sharpie and write your social security number on your arm so we can identify <laughs> you. <laughs> You know, but it, these things are that, it sounds funny, but I mean, the, you know, these things, it can be that serious. We've seen cars swept off the road in just a few inches of water, and people don't realize the power of the water coming over Plum Island Turnpike from the river. It is amazing, and I wouldn't put my, one of my vehicles through it, and if you're trying to drive your Ford Fiesta or your, your Prism through it, you're going to be a, a vessel floating in Ipswich Bay at some point, so... Those are things that we have to take seriously. I, mean, I make light of it here because we can, but um, we take it very seriously. And in order to evacuate is a really serious, it's a serious matter. And you don't want to be wrong on that. But I would rather err on the side of caution a hundred times and have people say, uh, Chief panic over here and he panics about everything than not order it and have people put in harm's way. So um, that's what Plum Island for the rest of the town, all we can do is stage people in various areas of town knowing we're going to lose certain roads and knowing our access will be limited. Um, have police or you can't get there, so stage in certain areas of town that we don't think we can have um, quick response to and help out as best we can and then just clean up afterwards. It's really all you can do. Shut down the roads that get over, overwashed. Don't let cars back over them until you inspect them because you don't know what's happening underneath the pavement. And um, once the, the roads are deemed safe by the highway superintendent, then we'll let traffic back over them. Uh, and shelters. I always forget shelters. Red Cross. We, we always open up shelters. If, if we're ordering an evacuation, we will have a place for you. Newbury Shelter is Newbury Elementary School on Hanover Street. Um, and if Newbury Elementary School is inaccessible due to flooding, we would go to Triton Regional. And if that's not accessible, one of our neighboring towns will take us in. Well, in Newburyport, we give you the Sharpie. <laughs> First and foremost, the most important training that I do, and I think all of us do, is that we're leaving home. So we have to leave our families behind. So we have to make sure that there's a plan in place for them because we're not coming back. And um, the worst case scenario being is to be someplace trying to help other people, knowing that your family, is, they're not safe or they're not well prepared. Um, I don't know why, and I'll give you a little hint here. Everybody runs out to buy milk and all these other things at the store. You're going to lose your power. You're going to lose all the stuff you bought. So buy things that will give you the ability to use them over a long period of time. And when we talk this storm, we're talking three, four days. Uh, most of your the, um, stores are going to lose whatever product they have in them or you can't get to it. So buy things that are going to be beneficial to you over a long period of time. Keeping in mind that the sewer plant may end up shutting down, so you may lose sewage in your facilities or your homes or whatever in the report. There's a lot of things to think about beyond the things that we expect 
anomaly. We'd never go beyond that thought process of thinking we're going to lose our water source, we're going to lose our sewer source. So buy and stock up on things that you really need. And I think it, what Bob had said, this would be the last time we would tell people, if you're in those areas and we identify those areas, now's the time to gather the things that you think of as most value to you, either put them on second floor stories up out of the way of harm's way or get them out of there. But don't wait till the last minute to take whatever you've got and get it out of there because, um, as they've said, when it comes, it comes very quickly, it deteriorates very quickly, and then we start seeing this whole thing about you just can't get um, where you want to go. We would definitely, uh, at this point with the information that we've got, we would order an evacuation of Salisbury Beach. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Because there is no way that we're going to put our public safety officials in that kind of danger to try to rescue people. We did it, believe it or not, I think it was the February storm last year, we had to rescue some people out of buildings. And we almost got some firefighters hurt doing it. And we just can't do that. We can't place those people at that kind of risk. So we're going to order. We're going to order an evacuation of Salisbury Beach. We're not going to allow anybody onto the beach because, as as um, Mike said a while back, one of the biggest problems we have is everybody wants to go down and see the big waves, and they don't want to see them from afar. They want to see them from right up on the ocean front. And then waves are breaking up over their cars, they're getting sandblasted and everything else, and they're standing there watching it. So we're just going to flat out shut it down. We're going to meet with National Grid, and we're going to ask them to shut off certain areas of the commercial section for natural gas, because I know from past experience that we're going to have problems with that. And there's nothing any worse than that type of a problem. Um, Route 1... Ferry Road are probably almost going to remain impassable for long periods of time. It's not going to just be during the high, the high tide cycles because the river is now pushing. Everything's coming downstream. The water can't get out. It just can't get out. And uh, those of you that have been around and saw what happened in the Mother's Day storm on Bridge Road, um, that was underwater for days and days and days. And the water just couldn't get out of there. And I mean, they're doing work now to rebuild the culvert, but that's not, if we get all this water backing up and coming downstream, and you've got the ocean holding it back, that's still not going to solve the problem. We're going to have major problems. So, uh, and we're going to have to coordinate that with the city of Newport as far as how, how they want to reroute the traffic. Uh, because, you know, nobody's going to be able to come through that way. We can't reroute them down Ferry Road because that's going to be flooded, too. That will be flooded a lot further than anybody realizes. That will come up well beyond the radio tower, believe it or not, and it will get pretty doggone deep. The first car that tries to drive through it will be the last one that drives through it because you won't get through it. And it's happened in the past. So... Um, We'd obviously be holding uh, regular strategy meetings. One of the comments that, that I feel I have to make, uh, as far as the Red Cross is concerned, that probably the only thing that we're going to be able to get from the Red Cross, and I think these gentlemen will agree with me, is a regional shelter. We're not going to be able to get individual shelters in each community. Um, but we have train some people to run a shelter so that we can we can operate a shelter and we can draw from some of the staff at the school and stuff as far as feeding people and stuff. So we do have the ability to do that. And we run it and we run it fairly successfully. So but we've got to get people off the beach at that point. There's there's no get no getting around it and and uh, we'll do what we have to do to get the word out to people that they gotta leave. Uh, because once the storm you know, this storm is imminent now. Once the storm develops, we're going to be handcuffed. We can't do anything to help them. You know, we can get National Guard vehicles in and stuff, but the water gets so deep that it just, you can't place that risk on people. So, so that's what we would be doing. And we would take that very, very serious, the evacuation. And obviously that would be put out with cold red and... 
change to a shelter in place order is a tough situation. If if there was if we had a storm that we felt that we're going to have a surge, roads are going to be flooded for a period of time, and then it's going to recede back, and they're going to be able to move again. We might not order we might order to shelter in place in a situation like that. We don't want a shelter in place on Salisbury Beach. There's been so much damage to the dunes down. I mean, it's like Plum Island. There's been so much damage to the dunes down there. There's places where there's 15 foot cliffs, and there's just not much left to protect those properties. And there's going to be a large number of buildings that are going to be lost. They're predicting, as part of the storm, that the ocean, um, the, all of the commercial properties on the ocean front are going to be damaged, severely damaged, and so on and so forth. So there's going to be a lot of property loss. So we got to get the people out of there and get them out of there early. But in other situations, yes, we would order a shelter in place, depending on what the situation is. That answer your question? Then they've got a sh they've got a shelter in place, but they're sheltering in place at a very high risk of uh, you know the no-name storm. We had the oceanfront sides of buildings blown right out, completely gone, washed right into the ocean, with elderly people inside of them, and it's a tough situation. I happened to go to get one family out and a wave broke up over and fortunately there was a retaining wall there. That's the only thing that saved me from God only knows what. I was able to get behind the wall. So that's not the time to get the people out is what I'm trying to say. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Um, at this point, we're into the event. Now, my bias is more the preparations, the actions ahead of the event, because I think that really determines, I think all three gentlemen agree with me, that really determines how well we actually are able to uh, manage through, uh, through the event, how resilient we will be. Certainly, there are some actions that could be a little more specific when we get into the post-event phase. But in the interest of time, in the interest of allowing time for, for more questions from the audience. I want to ask just one other thing, just briefly, if each one of you could indicate one or two things that you would like to be a takeaway for the folks here this evening. So may I ask you just think of one or two things briefly that you'd like to be a takeaway, and then we'll open it up to general questions. Um, the most important thing is we take Tom and I and Bob, we joke around a lot, but we take our jobs very seriously. We take emergency management very seriously. And if we're recommending or, or ordering an evacuation, we do that with extremely detailed information after a lot of debate. And take those orders seriously. That We don't do it lightheartedly. We're not trying to be overly cautious. You know, we have to balance those interests. but. Take those orders seriously because you know, we do that with a lot of information and we do that with a lot of discussion and brainstorming and you know those those orders do not come lightly. So please take those seriously if, if it ever got to that. Hopefully we never will have to. But if it did, if we have to order an Unexpected hard right or whatever the case may be, 
one comes back and, you know, it wasn't so bad, I could have stayed here. Rather that folks look at it from the perspective of just being thankful that uh, they were spared this time, dodged a bullet. But consider it, you know, if you're playing Russian roulette, you know, at what point, how many of those, uh, you know, live ammunition are you going to put up with before, well, maybe I'm not going to play this game. And, and that's the thing I think to be thinking about. When the risk is like insurance, there's a certain point when the risk is too high, you just can't take a chance. So again, uh, thank you, gentlemen. Let's open up for questions. And by the way, uh, unfair game is, well, you've got a captive meteorologist here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go ahead, sir. Hi, thank you. Um, just thank you, first, for your presentation, which was excellent, and the panel as well. I have to say it was riveting and anxiety-producing at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and that's why I want to segue over something you said, Mr. Mr. Cook. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. You mentioned it in your presentation <clears throat> in the beginning that uh, this area is got emergency management plans associated with the secret nuclear power plant. Yeah. At least that's what I heard. Um, and uh, I don't know, before I pose my question, which will be 10 seconds, I think everybody needs to know that the Seabrook plant, just to add a little horror to all this, is the third most vulnerable nuclear power plant in the nation to flooding Ooh. and storm surges. This came out in the study that was published in the Washington Post in March of 2013. You can just read about it yourself. And it was done by Stanford University, a very prestigious university. So what I'm positing, following on what you were saying, Mr. Cook, is that it isn't impossible that there could be a radiological release from the plant at the exact same time there's a storm surge here, because both of them will be affected. The containment reactor is less than two miles from the coast, by the way, but it's not just the coastline, just not the uh, containment building. So my question is, do your each of your town's emergency response plan for the <coughs> for Seabrook have a section on what will be done if there is a high impact storm surge, such as the type that we're positing today, because it could happen and not because of a storm, but because of an earthquake. Remember, Fukushima, I'm the co-founder of No More Fukushima, is a local group concerned about this issue, actually had a surge of water, not from a storm, and 150,000 people were in trouble. As part of the planning process <coughs> for the Seabrook Station, um, there are certain things that they have to do when certain things happen. Uh, I'll just use a hurricane as an example. When the winds reach a certain point, they have to declare an unusual event. When they declare an unusual event, the local communities have to be notified. When the local communities are notified, they immediately review their plans to see what steps they need to take. It would be the same with a flood. If they have a very small fire over there, off, not in the nuclear sector, but in on the site, they have to notify us of that immediately. So I, I, I'm comfortable myself that we're going to get properly notified if anything <coughs> unusual happens over there. I also will state that it's probably the safest plant in the country. It's the safest, best built plant in the country. I've been in there personally myself. I've seen it. And, and I understand a lot of people's concerns and stuff, but they are required by regulation to notify us of any one of these situations. And the plans are very extensive as to what we have to do. And we're going to always err, like on a storm, we're going to err on the <coughs> side of safety. If there's any question, we're going to take the steps necessary to protect our citizens. Is that? I actually asked a very specific question. Does your city's or town's emergency management plan, in conjunction with the Seagull plant, address the possibility that there could be a simultaneous radiological release from the plant 
and a storm surge in your town at the same time. Yes, they do. I feel comfortable what they do. What, what's the plan? I mean, what would we do if there was a uh, radiological? We'd have to do it. We would have to determine the wind direction, so on and so forth, and then make a decision whether we want to evacuate. The There's a lot of people involved in that. There's all kinds of monitors. The state would be, uh, I don't know, Mike, if you want to speak to this some. Um, the state would be actively involved in, in, in uh, the decision-making process. Uh, there's monitoring equipment right at the fire station that monitors the air quality at all times. You know, there's, there's all kinds of safeguards in place. I feel comfortable with them. To make you feel just a little bit better, uh, and I didn't include these visuals in the, uh, in the uh, presentation, I didn't want to overwhelm you, but there are some, some inundation uh, maps um, that we provided the, the directors with. <laughs> Although the Seabrook plant may be one of the more vulnerable ones in the country, it still showed the relative to, to storm surge, it still showed the plant being relatively high to the, uh, the waters coming in. So hopefully those models are correct in their assessments of a storm surge and how it might impact Seabrook. And that should make us feel a little bit better. Still, yeah, I mean, personally, I always, in the back of my mind, feel a little bit nervous about having a new plant in my backyard and seeing what happened in, uh, in Japan is certainly, uh, you know, cause for concern. Um, but uh, we also have to realize, too, there's a lot of scrutiny now on these new plants because of what happened over in Japan. And we have to hope that you know, the systems are in place um, to deal with that. Uh, in our scenario here, I mean, winds would be howling pretty hard from the east to southeast, so that's throwing everything back up into New Hampshire, and that makes anybody feel better. Right now. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> okay, we got about two minutes. Well, about two minutes, and Bill Sargent has something he says, so a real quick response from Bill, and then people we've got to leave. Okay. Yeah. You want to take a question first, or? Okay. We'll go ahead and wrap it up, because this is. Yeah, okay. Well, very, then just very quickly, I mean, we could probably discuss and interact. It's good that there are the questions that are here. We could obviously go on for, for much longer. I think we, we all need to remember this is something that we are going to be sooner or later faced with. And if it's not on our watch, it's going to be on somebody following us. And so what we do today, I think, can make a, a real impact in tomorrow. And there are many dimensions to this, but a very important dimension is just the idea of awareness um, and, uh, and education. And, uh, and looking uh, ahead uh, some distance down the road, especially given the backdrop of, of sea level rise. So some actions we take today can make a big difference <coughs> tomorrow, and we've got to keep our situation aware of so, so. First of all, I want to thank all of you. Um, I think you were almost as good as the Oscars and much better than the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> We do have uh, a couple uh, gifts just to uh, show you our appreciation for coming here. And I'm going to start with Mike, and, and I, I won't read the inscription, but it says, Any Porch and Storm. And I think you know what that means. <laughs> and uh, I'll be giving them out to the rest of you.